Hey, I'm Nick. You know, I haven't been on YouTube for very long, but in the time that I have been on, I've noticed that top 10 videos are really, really popular for some reason. You know, that's great and all, but what you might not have known is that there actually is a book called The Big Book of Lists, which is quite literally a book all about the best of the best. You should really check it out. And while it may not be the most scientific book in the world, if you check out the second volume, the book actually has a list of what the authors claim to be the most intelligent creatures on Earth besides humans. And while that may not be accepted by all scientists, it's interesting because if you take a look, all the animals on the list are either birds or mammals. That's great and all, but you probably don't need a book to know that the term bird brain isn't really nice to call someone. But the thing is, it's not really justified either. You see, birds and mammals alike are warm-blooded creatures, meaning that they're called endothermic creatures, which ultimately means that they're able to produce their own body heat in their environments around them. So, baby, if it's cold outside, don't get a bigger coat. Get a bigger brain. Extra brain matter seems to have developed in warm-blooded creatures for this reason, especially in mammals, making them, well, warmer as they got bigger, and inadvertently smarter too as their brains got bigger. You know, the problem is with big reptiles like the dinosaurs, who don't have warm-blooded features, their brains kind of stayed the same as they got bigger. So while it is true that having a bigger brain might have made us more intelligent, at least a little bit, it may have actually made us braver. What if I told you that chronic stress can actually kill your brain cells in a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is essential for creating new memories? Now, the significant thing about what these studies tell us is that the smaller the hippocampus gets, the increased likeliness for certain fear-based disorders, like PTSD. Don't worry, you're not gonna get PTSD, though. All this shows is that it's impossible to overdose on a chill pill. However, it might be hard to take one when, say, I don't know, a T-Rex is plummeting through your window. In this famous Jurassic Park scene, those screams are not just acting. Those are authentic screams when the T-Rex animatronic head malfunctioned. It wasn't supposed to break through the glass like you saw in the film. Thankfully, the truck was dino-proof, right? Or was it? Would we be ready if dinosaurs came back? Better yet, could we bring them back? Well, to answer this, Jurassic Park the movie is a pretty good place to start. If you haven't seen the original film, scientists in the movie extract dinosaur DNA from ancient amber, from fossilized bugs trapped in the ancient amber. And they use this to replicate the dinosaurs. All until things start going wrong, of course. A fascinating film concept, to say the very least. But, sadly, I think Jurassic Park will have to stay within the realms of science fiction. To find a mosquito that well-preserved, with that much dinosaur blood in it, that big and from that long time ago, is incredibly rare to find, you see. But in fact, this Montana mosquito might be the only one of its kind ever found. The next issue with Jurassic Park's theory is all about timing. You see, that mosquito is 46 million years old, and she's in fantastic shape. But we would need a mosquito that's 65 million years ago. Now imagine how hard that is to find from the Mesozoic era, the last time a dinosaur ever walked the Earth. Resurrecting the dinosaurs is a lot harder than an archaeological game of hide-and-seek. You see, once we have the specimen, assuming we find it, that contains dinosaur DNA, we have to extract it. Now, could we do this? Researchers at Manchester University in the UK attempted to answer this very question. They tried this with insects frozen in copal, which is a material millions of years younger than prehistoric amber. And sadly, their conclusion was that 
DNA does not stay frozen with the specimen and decays over a significant period of time. But hey, whoever said that we need to use bugs to get dinosaur DNA? Spielberg? If you wanted dinosaur DNA, why not just ask him? Paleontologist Mary Schweitzer actually found living residue on a Tyrannosaurus rex's leg bone over 70 million years old. As fascinating as this story is, well, it's a little spooky. Because what it would tell us is that dinosaurs aren't as old as we think they are. Perhaps it's something they don't want you to know. Kidding. It turns out that paleontologist Tom Key, just one year after the discovery, brought solid evidence that said the tissue was really just bacterial resin left behind. So, long story short, the main problem with resurrecting the dinosaurs like in Jurassic Park is that we don't have access to purified DNA. And even if we did, resurrecting them and coding their DNA would be another problem. To bring back the dinosaurs, we would have to clone them, obviously. We would take their DNA and impregnate a syndicate mother of a similar species with that DNA. Researchers are actually doing this with a real-life woolly mammoth, well-preserved for all these years. What they do is they take woolly mammoth DNA and coat it in elephant skin cells, the ones we have today, and then impregnate another living elephant with those cells, with the hope of fertilizing a whole new living woolly mammoth descendant. Now, this is possible because we have living elephants who are similar enough to mammoths to do this. With dinosaurs, though, you could see the problem. We don't have creatures alive today who are similar enough to dinosaurs to actually clone them. Okay, so we might not have a lot of dinosaur relatives alive today, but we have more than enough dinosaur descendants alive today. Most of you didn't know that all these birds I can hear in the background are actually descendants of dinosaurs. That's right. And who can forget alligators, crocodiles, and the Komodo dragon? So an answer to your question could probably be no, we can't bring the dinosaurs back because there's nothing to bring back. Dinosaurs are still here today. That might not be the answer you're looking for though. And my response to you would be this. Whoever said we have to bring them back artificially? Who says that dinosaurs can't come back naturally? Did you know that reptiles and amphibians are the same thing? Well, at one time they were. At least classified as the same thing. You see, Carl Linnaeus is a Swedish man who lived a very long time ago, but he's known as the father of our modern day animal classification system. And he mistakenly, from Sweden, classified the only reptile in his area, a form of water snake, as an amphibian. There was a time when re reptiles and amphibians alike were the same thing. Now, today we know that this isn't true, but early dinosaurs and reptiles alike evolved the ability to lay hard shell eggs as they moved on land, something amphibians do not do. But what's really baffling about the evolution of the dinosaurs is how they got so big, how everything in that era got so big, when today we have, well, small. Remember when we talked about temperature earlier? Well, it turns out that the Jurassic world, no pun intended, was a lot warmer than the world is today, and it had a lot more carbon dioxide in it as well. Now, what both of these factors did is it allowed for rapid vegetation to grow, which is where we get the infamous Jurassic jungles we know of today. Now, what this did, all this vegetation allowed, was, well, a great food supply, which is a great theory to why dinosaurs, both vegetarian and carnivorous alike, got so big. In order for the dinosaurs to return to Earth, our planet, and then the creatures of that planet, would have to undergo tremendous changes, radical changes, that will easily take millions of years to undergo. We contemporary humans probably will not see the return of dinosaurs. Ever. Neither in our lifetime or the lifetime of our species. But, again, the question remains, did the dinosaurs really die out in the first place? Look around you. Everything from the birds in these trees, 
to the stuff you put in your gas tank is evidence that the dinosaurs are still with us. And I'm not just talking about figuratively here. I'm talking about literally with us. How can something with such a tremendous impact in our movies, in our museums, and yes, in our nightmares, really be extinct? I guess the dinosaurs tell us a valuable lesson, that nothing is really extinct until you stop believing in it. If that's a good enough answer for you, I'm going to have to let you decide. But uh, as for me, I say good riddance. I might have to get out of here. Thanks for tuning in.